guys, welcome to the Legacy Wealth Show with Tim Bratz. I have an awesome guest here, a good friend of mine, Scott Hannes. And uh, we're gonna be talking heavily about how to build uh, high-performing, results-driven teams. Scott um, was the, the VP of, a human res of human resources for a private equity firm with over 950 employees. Um, uh, and this private equity firm that he, he used to work for, he now has his own consulting business. We'll get into that probably a little bit later, but uh, the, the private equity company that he used to work for would go into businesses and essentially Scott and the COO would go in and put new people, processes, systems in place to turn around failing companies and distressed companies. And they'd come in, put all these things in place, uh, automate the business and, and uh, have better teams there in order to have a more successful company. And then they'd let it cash flow. So they turn the whole ship around, have a lot of success, very similar to what I do in apartment buildings, right? So I go find distressed yeah. apartment buildings, fix them all up, put better systems and management and, and, uh, um, fix up the property itself and the management process and then, uh, you know, let it cash flow for long-term wealth building. So Scott used to do the exact same thing in the, in the human resources world and did that with, uh, with the previous company with 950 employees, the company that he was VP of human resources for before that had 1100 companies. He led the entire turnaround of that entire, uh, U S based company. Um, but they, they operated in three different countries. Uh, this is a really, really cool stat on Scott. He's, contested and won over 125 state unemployment claims throughout his career. So he's 125 and 0 against employees trying to claim unemployment for wrongful, you know, misfiring and, or things like that. And he's had it so documented, has his systems and processes in place so well that he's 125 and 0 for everybody who's ever brought an unemployment case against him. So I think that's an awesome metric. Uh, but Scott, Awesome to have you here, buddy. Thank you for being here on the, on the Legacy Wealth Show. Thanks for having me, Tim. I appreciate it. Why don't you give everybody a little bit of just high-level background on how you got into human resources, uh, why, and then let's talk a little bit more about like why is human resources so important? It's one of those things where it's not the sexy, the cool stuff where it's like sales, right, or marketing, or the things that show front end, um, like the revenue generation stuff. But if you want to build a real team, if you want to build a real business, if you want to build an automated business where the, you are running the business and the business isn't running you and you really have a team in place that can passively create income for you. Even if it's a transactional kind of business, it can create a, a passive income for you as the owner if you have the right team in place. So human resources, as I've continued to grow, is one of those things that has become more and more and more and more important and really is like one of the most important things that I focus on right now is, is leading and developing my team. So I, I'm super excited for our conversation. Tell me a little bit or tell, tell the listeners a little bit about you and what your background is, um, uh, you know, and, and parlay on anything that I had already mentioned. And then let's talk a little bit more about how important HR is in order to build uh, a good foundation for your business. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. So again, Scott Hannes, Vice President of HR, just uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, just left my job uh, as a private equity company as a VP. Uh, helping lead another successful turnaround. Uh, got into HR back 15 years ago, uh, really through an acquaintance. Uh, got a job at Electrosound, uh, which is a privately held company, and got an opportunity to come in there and really kind of help them build an HR department that wasn't existing. And so really got my feet wet, kind of trial by fire, just thrown to the wolves. And I'm a people person, wanted to get engaged and work with employees to help them you know, as well as help the company. And so progressively worked my way up from an HR manager to a director of HR for the Americas, all the way up to a VP of HR. So it's been a, a good career progression. And so uh, the reason why I love HR, it's all about helping people. It's about helping businesses. It's marrying the two. You know, you can get people to join your team, but then it's how do you manage? How do you coach? How do you lead them? And that's really where HR comes in when you talk about development and the organizational success of the business. Love it, man. So tell me, and, and so now after leading multiple companies, big turnarounds with thousands of employees, uh, you started your own consulting firm in order to help small businesses uh, go from being a small business to a bigger business, a better business, and kind of, a, kind of like a, a good to great type scenario, right? So I know we brought you guys in to my business and um, you've been able to come in, sit down with my team, interview my entire team. Um, we, we worked a lot on core values, putting core values together for the company. That's something that we all operate from, but maybe don't have written down. And I, I want to dive deep into core values and some of these other things. You've also helped us hire people, 
and, um, and then measure their performance on an ongoing basis. All things that I think we, we probably neglect as, you know, early entrepreneurs trying to get in that, you know, zero up to a million dollars in gross revenue is kind of the experimental phase, right? Let me, let me make sure that this thing works. Let me make sure that the business is more of a proof of concept at that time than it is an actual business. Then once you get into that like million to probably doing 10 million, maybe $15 million uh, a year in gross revenue, you realize you got something and you're making some money and it's good money. The issue is it's not enough money to bring in high level, multiple six figure talent, all those A players that you need in order to take your business, you know, on a trajectory that, that that's, you know, out of this world. So, um, and that's kind of where, where I was, I was kind of in that transition. And, that, and if you're, when, if you're in that phase doing a, a million to maybe 10, $15 million a year in revenue, that's a very difficult position to be in because it, like I said, you have enough money that you're making good money, but not enough to bring in the A player talent, but it's like hell, right? And so you're, you're still spinning your wheels and you're becoming an adult babysitter. And that's why it's important yeah. to have like people like you to be able to come in and, yeah. and kind of be like, you know, you can hire a fractional CFO or you can hire a fractional um, uh, human resources director like you to come in on a part-time basis or just on a, on a consulting type basis to help out with a lot of that stuff. You don't have to pay a multiple six figure um, salary to somebody to come in and, you know, review your books from a CFO level or from a human resources level. Um, you don't need somebody in house to do all your hiring and firing. Like they have consultants like you out there that can come in on a part-time basis, which is, which is hugely helpful. So, um, uh, so let's dive into, let's talk a little bit about the, the, what you did with my company and what you did with my team and kind of where I was and kind of where we've been um, through, through the, the course of that action. So um, if, if, a, if, it, if a business owner were to bring you in, what's one of the first things that you look at in that business to make sure that they have the right foundation and framework kind of set up? Like what does that process look like for you when, you're, when, you're, when somebody hires you to come in? Yeah, great question, Tim. So I think it's all about your foundation. So what what does your building blocks of your company look like? You know, how have you, you know, built the business up currently? Where are you at? Where do you want to go? What are your goals? And then it's really understanding, okay, what are your company values? You know, your company values are your, your core building blocks. It's your foundation for your business. And it helps people understand where you're going as an organization. It helps you when you have a difficult decision and you need to understand, you know, what do I do? And you can look to those company values and help you kind of have kind of the way that you're supposed to treat your employees as well as you treat your customers or your clients. So I think that's really important when you talk about, you know, your building blocks. And then with that comes, you know, the next steps of the kind of the hiring evolution where you're looking for talent. And when you bring talent in, you want everybody to be on the same page um, so you can build a high performing team. And so with that, I think the company value section was really important when we worked together, Tim, mm -hmm. you know, identifying that, but not doing it just you and I, you know, getting your team involved, going through an exercise, understanding, you know, what the team's interests are, what they believe, you know, to be company values, and then, you know, agreeing them uh, as, a, as a whole, and then putting them out there so everybody can kind of live it. Because, you know, company values are great if you have them, but you need to be able to live them out too. It can't just be lip service. So actions, mm -hmm. you know, they say actions speak louder than words, you got to continue to live those out. And that's, and that's powerful stuff. So let's rewind just a second. One core, the core values, we all operate from a, a standpoint of having some sort of core values, whether they're written down or not, right? Like we know how we make decisions. And the issue with that though, is your, does your team have the same core values? Do you all understand, um, uh, you know, how to make decisions if something difficult comes up and making sure that your team is on the same page as you. And I always thought, man, core values are one of those things that big companies just kind of put up on the wall in order for like, uh, you know, it's kind of a people pleaser. Like this is how we operate just yeah. so uh, everybody thinks that we're good people, you know? And yeah. I'm like, Dude, it's such BS. I don't need to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> but then as I started building a team and I started making decisions in different ways and uh, you know, maybe, maybe, doing the cheap fix instead of doing it the right way. Right. And I'm like, listen, like that creates a, not, not only is it not the right thing to do, but it creates a ton of liability on, on us as a business and as me as the business owner. And like one, I don't want to do that because these people are, are buying a home from us or they're, they're renting a home from us or whatever that looks like. And, um, uh, they deserve something nicer than a cheap 
Band-Aid on a fix, you know, and we need to make sure it's done the right way. It, we're building up a, a basis of assets, of apartment buildings and all these things. Like, let's do it the right way because we plan on building legacy wealth with this stuff, you know, over the course of the next 10, 15, 20 years. And then there's people on my team who came in just like they thought for whatever reason, it's probably my, or it's definitely my fault as being the owner of not conveying that you know, price is not the most important thing, right? It's value and it's, it's quality and, and a lot of those things. And so by you coming in and us sitting down and uh, this is a really, really important piece is having the team there for this conversation and yep. going through the exercise of saying, hey, what are our core values? What are the beliefs that our company has? And what are the actions that stand behind those beliefs? Um, and all of a sudden when it's, your team giving that information to you, it's not you dictating it to them and they have an instant buy-in. These are our core values versus the CEO's core values versus the owner's core values. It's our core values. And then when that happens, uh, what I've noticed is that if somebody on the team is not living by those core values and not operating by those core values and not making decisions by those core values, other members of the team then hold that person accountable. And it's Absolutely. powerful stuff, man. So that way I don't have to do it as the CEO. My COO doesn't have to do it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a self-policing type vehicle. And it's, um, it's just, you know, gets us all on the same page and look it in the right direction. So, uh, yeah, core values have been really, really powerful for us. So that's the first thing that you do when you, when you sit down with an organization, you're sitting down with them, asking them, what are your core values? Let me look at those. Let me read those. And if they don't have them, then you would lead an exercise with the team in order to put some of those things in, in place and have them on paper, right? Yeah. And, and to me, that's the building blocks of the organization, really. And, you know, it's again, how you live it out. How do you work? How do you operate? And then I think the next step is really like what we did with your business, Tim, is sitting down with each of the team members. You know, asking them, you know, do you like working here? Do you not like working here? What, you know, what's, what are you passionate about? Going through those th diff uh, different things. So you get an idea of where everybody's head's at. And then it's about defining, okay, what, are, what roles and responsibilities is each person doing on your team? You know, yep. and, you know, like with your team, I asked everybody to write those things down and, you know, then define, you know, kind of what their role responsibility is. So they kind of stay in their lane. So you have a structure put in place. So you don't have to worry about, you know, Johnny's doing this and Sally's doing this and nobody's collaborating and no one's on the same page. So it's important that you have those defined roles and responsibilities. And then from those discussions, Tim, you know, we built out job descriptions for every single employee yeah. on your team. And that really kind of, again, holds them accountable, just like the, you know, the core values do in, you know, your company values. And that just really helps you so you can manage your team successful and you don't have to worry about, you know, babysitting as much, you know, because mm -hmm. in, in HR, to your point, it's not always sexy not always glamorous, but it really, I mean, people are your most important asset. And without mm -hmm. your people on your team, like you don't get half the stuff done. I mean, you can be a, a great entrepreneur by yourself, but without a successful team, that's all in the, you know, rolling the same boat in the same direction. You're not going to be as successful as you want to be, you know? So it's important yeah. you have that, that unity, you have that, you know, team camaraderie, you have that teamwork in order to continue to grow your business and scale it up. hundred percent, man. I a hundred percent agree and believe that you know, there's, there's two things you can spend money on. That's an actual investment in your business. One is marketing. You always see a return on investment, right? And two is people, you know, you hire somebody, you pay them 60 grand a year or hundred grand a year or 200 grand a year. You, you can expect a return on that investment. You might be paying them a hundred thousand dollars a year, but they might be generating a million dollars a year of revenue for your business. And so you always see a return on that. I think it's one of those things that it's, it's not as easy to quantify as a marketing, uh, um, as putting some marketing in place, like a direct mail campaign or a, a you know, ringless voicemail campaign or some, one of those types of things where you can spend money on advertising on a Facebook ad and you see the metric of how much comes in immediately. With people, you see it at the end of the year with the financials, but can you attribute 100% to that or not? So it's a little bit more difficult and I think that's maybe why people don't, um, don't value it as much, but a hundred percent, man, once, once I hired an employee and I saw the results and how it freed up my time and we made more money, it was super, super impactful. So let's talk a little bit more about the, um, uh, you had mentioned a little bit about like the org chart and everything. So what I like what you're saying, Scott, is it's very, it's a very simple framework. Okay. So you come in, you figure out what the foundation is first, and then you figure out kind of a little bit of the, that's a little bit of like the past. And now you're figuring out the present of um, 
what does the current organizational chart look like? You know, who's where, who's in what box, which box do we need? Let's, let's write out the boxes first and figure out what the different uh, roles and responsibilities are. And then let's figure out who in the organization fits into each one of those different boxes and, and put a very clearly defined um, sheet and, and, and essentially bullet points of the roles and the responsibilities and the job uh, title and everything for that job. Um, now, now when you do that though, how do you get away from, Hey, that's not my job description or Hey, that's, that's, that's not on me. That's this person's job. So like one of the things in my organization, I want everybody to have a hundred percent ownership over the company not just their role. So I want to, I want to get them to come in and say, Hey, listen, you know, so-and-so sick or so-and-so's, you know, kind of a, a, a weak link or not, not, not I don't want to say it in a, in, a, in a demeaning or adverse way or what, you know, somebody needs a little bit of help. They're, they're, cons there's consumed, they're overwhelmed. And what does that look like in order to get other people to feel like, Hey, listen, let me pitch in, let me help out because we don't want the company to, to struggle. And, and uh, even though it's not in their job description, how do I get them to uh, uh, have, you know, a little bit of the ambition and a little bit of the um, willingness to help in other aspects in case we need that? Not saying that that's their job description, but how do you, how do you stop that from, hey, one, it's not, my, it's not my job description, so I don't need to do that. That's somebody else's problem, not mine. Um, or am I, am I wrong? Should I not have everybody have a global mentality for the business and just let them focus on what their, what their role is. Yeah. Th those are great points, Tim. I think, you know, a lot of times I think companies try to put people like on the org, we'll go to the org chart first. So a lot of times people put people in roles where they think they should be and not always do you have the right people on your team. So to mm -hmm. your point, you need to identify what, you know, slots you want to have under your org chart. And then if you don't have that right talent, I mean, that's why HR, that's why I have a job, right? Because at the end of the day, Sometimes you have to get rid of people and there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And when you do it the right way, you can be, you know, it can be a very successful transition. You can make sure that, you know, you don't have lawsuits uh, and things that are going to give you additional risk in your business. But at the end of the day, it, it comes down to, you know, how do you hire the talent that you're bringing into the organization? What are the roles, responsibilities you're trying to define? What do you want them to do? And then when you bring them in, Tim, it's all about, you know, how do you manage coach and lead? So, you know, I think it all starts with relationships. So anytime I bring on a new employee with, with my, you know, with my last job with 950 employees, it's how do I onboard them? What's that process look like? You know, I always have them sit down with each of the members of management. They go through a process where they're building relationships, understanding what that manager does, and really get an idea of kind of what that person's like. Because once you have that you know, relationship built, it's real easy to go to Johnny or Sally and say, look, I need you to help me with this because we got this, this, and this going on. So it's about building that relationship. It's about having, you know, direct and open communication with your team. You know, if you're expecting a cross-functional, diverse team that's going to be able to maybe help out with uh, sales or acquisitions one day, and then maybe is working on project management the next day because someone's out sick, you know, you got to have that relationship and you got to have everybody on the same page. And that's, again, where those company values come in. That's where, you know, when you're bringing in your talent and you're, you're looking for A-level talent that you make sure you bring in people that want to help and want to help you succeed and grow. And that's where also your, you know, your, your business goals as the owner, you know, you got to be able to communicate those very clearly to your employees. So they know what the top end goal is like today, you know, we may have a million dollars in real estate and in five years we want to be at 10 million. Well, how are you going to get there? I mean, that's great to have that number out there, but what's your step goal plans? What do those look like? You know, do you have, you know, KPIs, key performance indicators that are driving your business? Do you have smart goals that are objectives that you know, are driving your employee performance? If you don't have those things, I mean, people are going to do what they do every day, which is the same thing. And you know that that's the definition of insanity and mm -hmm. things don't get better and it's chaos. And then you're calling me, Tim, saying, hey, Scott, I don't know why Johnny's not doing this or Sally's not doing that. So, I mean, everything ties together based upon how you communicate, the relationships you have and getting everybody to buy into this idea that you're building a great organization and you want them to be a part of it. You know, to your point, they're resourceful. You know, they're able to get stuff done on their own. If they don't know something, they're taking the initiative and doing stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and that all goes back to how you coach, lead, and you manage your employees. So it goes back to setting expectations, right? It goes back to what your core values are and how you make a decision. And so there is no, no right or wrong, I guess, is, is what I got from that response, as long as it's 
a clearly uh, communicated expectation to your entire team and to especially that role and, and that position. So Absolutely. that's good. That's a good answer, man. So um, I love that you hit on KPIs. I love that you hit on metrics um, and having metrics in place to measure your business. Because if you cannot measure your business, you cannot manage your business, right? Correct. So you got to have measurements, quantifiable metrics in place to see, are you growing or are you dying, right? Are you ripening or are you yep. rotting? And what does that whole uh, thing look like? So, okay, right, so we created core values in order to set the foundation. Now we have an organizational chart um, with all the different positions and making sure with, that with our current team, we have the right, the right people in the right seats which yep. is a really important piece. And then filling in any of those other seats. We'll, we're going to come back to probably hiring and firing. I, I think we'll probably um, talk on that a little bit later. Uh, I want to get, you know, get in the framework all set in place. So once you know that, now on those roles and responsibilities, you're putting KPIs, key performance indicators, those metrics, those quantifiable uh, numbers in place to measure um, how those people are doing. So how do you do it? You use SMART goals, right? Yeah. I, so I've always used smart goals or in my last job, we use what's called PPOs, personal performance objectives. So what's a and smart goal? Smart goal is something that's specific. It's measurable. It's achievable or attainable. It's realistic. And there's a time centered, uh, you know, goal around it. So again, clear. Can you, can, you hit on, can you hit on each one of those real quick? Yeah. So specific, you know, so you want to really make sure it's defined and it's clearly laid out. So a good example, let me give you a good example here. Like on a sales acquisitions person, a uh, specific goal might be that you, you know, reach out to 100 new leads on a, on a weekly basis. So that's something that's very specific. Uh -huh. And then you measure that, you know, the, the number is, is it 100? And did they hit that in that week time frame or did they not? Is that achievable? I think 100, you know, it's roughly, you know, what? I can't even do the math. 25, no, 20, yeah. 20 a day? 20, yeah, 20 a day. Sorry, I can't do math. Uh, that's why I'm in HR. I'm not in finance. Uh, so 20 a day. So, I mean, that's, that's achievable, right? People can make 20 calls in a day. Yep. It's realistic. It, it's relevant to that person's role because at the end of the day, they're out there trying to build your business and get you additional deal flow based upon, you know, their sales title and their responsibilities and their, you know, the job uh, that they're doing. And then you want to put like a time, you know, metric around it. So at the end of the day, you know, like a weekly basis is good. And then you can quantify that even further, you know, in a month time frame. you can do that over a quarter, you can do that over six months, over a year. And at the end of the day, you're able to say, okay, Johnny's performing or, or Sally's not, it just depends on where they're at. And yep. so, you know, having those types of uh, smart goals or objectives are important. You know, if you have an assistant, another one might be, you know, uh, generating, you know, um, you know, marketing campaigns for you as your business. And so they could be posting stuff on social media and you could have a goal, a specific goal that you want to increase your social media presence. And you can measure that by, you know, the assistant needs to post, you know, 10 different uh, social media posts in a, in a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's achievable. It's attainable. It's realistic. You know, that's again, that's two per day, you know, in a five day work week. And obviously there's a time metric around it because it's, it's there, you know, and it's something you can quantify. So love it, man. No, that's, that's good stuff. So, uh, putting those KPIs in place, setting very clear expectations, not unrealistic expectations, something that they can actually hit. And then one of the things that we, we've been doing is we actually go to our employees and we say, Hey, here's what you were able to achieve last week. Yep. You know, what is, you tell me what the goal is for next week. Right. Yep. So now all of a sudden they're, they're creating their own goals and then it comes to a place like, like I am such a sissy when it comes to firing people. I've had people on my team for way too long because I want to help everybody, right? I want people, um, I want it more for them than they want it for themselves most times even. And, uh, and then, it, and then I become like friends with them. And, but then all of a sudden the business suffers because they're not performing. It right. hurts team morale because other people aren't, uh, are, are seeing this person not doing their work, but still getting a paycheck. And, it, and it's no good. So one of the things that's really helped with us with KPIs is have them, have the employee give the number, give the KPI, give the goal for the following week, and then measure it, obviously, hold them accountable to it. And if they continuously miss their goals or continuously goes in a downward trajectory, you know what happens? They end up firing themselves. Hey, why didn't you, why didn't you hit this goal? Well, you know, I, I, I guess I'm just not cut out for this job, you know? All right. Well, well, I mean, should we, should we part ways? Yeah, I think we should part ways. That's a way easier conversation than to sit down with people and feel like you're going to rip their heart out. Right. That's so, right. 
um, it, it, it's like a, again, a self-policing kind of vehicle where they're, they're seeing their, their performance or their lack thereof. And then they're making a decision on, is this something that I want to continue doing or not? And it actually makes your life a lot easier as, as the owner of the business Absolutely. because they end up leaving um, the role instead of you even having to fire them. So now it's voluntary. And now you know that there's not going to be any sort of HR type issues coming back in. And that's been a big piece of the pie for, uh, for us on the metrics standpoint and just letting people know that you're measuring their, their performance. So that way, again, that, that whole accountability piece, it's like, it's like going to the gym, right? And having to report in on your weight every single day. If you're going to make sure you get out of bed and you actually go and work out and you eat a little bit healthier, you're going to make a little bit better of a decision. Maybe get some vegetables as your side instead of French fries as your side when you go out to eat, just because you know, you got to weigh in again, you know, with everybody else at the gym the next day. And so because of that accountability piece with KPIs, it holds everybody accountable because we're sharing the KPIs with everybody on a weekly basis. Everybody's seeing them. It's not like it's a, uh, like a hidden thing that you're only talking to with the manager, everybody sees what the numbers are. And, um, and so it has group accountability. Yeah. And Tim, I guess I'd, I'd like to touch on a couple other things you just said. So I think number one, you know, when you have the KPIs defined and the employee has buy-in to your point where you do like a goal setting session with an employee, you know, with the manager, you know, then it's facts and data. And that's where it makes it real easy because, you know, there's no gray area. You take the emotion out of it, especially if you have someone who's not performing. So to your point, it makes it a way easier, you know, discussion and conversation. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing too, I mean, goals and objectives. So like smart goals are a little bit more defined than a KPI because it's over a longer period of time. So with the smart goals, I mean, if you're going to change those on an employee, typically you need to get the employees buy-in. You need to make sure they're aware of it. Again, it goes back to that communication because you don't want to say, you know, midway through a quarter, Hey, I'm changing your smart goals because then they're going to say, okay, what, which one do you want me to do? Do you want me to yep. do this or do you want me to do that? You know, the KPIs, I think, measure the day-to-day -day aspects of your business. The SMART goals are a little bit more longer, you know, uh, focus, you know, so like within a given six month or a year time uh, frame normally. Love it, man. Cool. So we, we've had the foundation of core values. We've talked about putting an org chart together, uh, finding out what those different positions are, putting the right people in the right seats. And, and putting certain metrics in place so that way they meet their roles and responsibilities. Now, let's say I don't have the right person for the right seat. <clears throat> um, and so I guess that, uh, we'll start on, or I don't have anybody for that seat. How do I go out and find good people? Like, like right now, the economy's booming, everybody's got a job, right? And how do I go out and find good people for my organization? And I, I think that's a, a piece of the puzzle that a lot of business owners are lacking uh, or struggling with is finding good people for their organization. How do I find somebody who's going to do their job, you know, who's going to um, uh, be able to just perform, just get the stuff done that I need to have done versus me having to be an adult babysitter and, and go through all that stuff. So um, what does that process look like when you're trying to go out and hire uh, somebody of quality? Yeah. So with, with my and, business and, and Scott, this could be, this could be someone of quality who comes in and, and sweeps the floors or, or, um, and it could be somebody hiring of quality of, of, of bringing in a CFO for a business. So it could be a $25,000 a year job. It could be a $250,000 a year job. How do I find good people? Great question. And, and you're right. Unemployment uh, rate right now in the U S is 3.6%. And so you're really at full employment because people, you know, can't pass a background check, they can't pass a drug screen. So and it's very challenging. There's a number of different ways you can go about finding talent. And so number one, you could always, you know, hire me. Uh, I'm happy to help you out. And, you know, because I have that expertise doing it for 15 years, I've hired thousands of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but, at, but at the end of the day, I mean, there's a number of ways you can post your ads on Indeed, you can do stuff on Facebook, you can put the stuff on Craigslist, you can ask for referrals. Uh, but with that, it all starts with your job description. What is this person going to be doing? What's the compensation rate going to be? Is that compensation rate, you know, within the market, you know, so it's, it's doing some market studies, analyzing, okay, for example, an assistant should make around $15 an hour, we'll say. And so if you're going to pay that person $10 an hour, you have to understand good expectations on your part that you may not get a quality person at $10 an hour. If you pay the market rate at 15, you're going to get a much more qualified person that's going to help engage and grow your team. So, so how, how do you, how do you, um, look up that metric like how do you know that? i mean i'm sure uh an assistant in cleveland ohio is probably i'd assume paid less than an assistant in 
San Diego, California, or in Manhattan in New York City? Like, how, is, is there some place to go and look up what a standard person in that role gets paid? Yeah, so uh, the, like the free sites that are out there, like the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's www.bls.gov. And you can type in a job title and see kind of what the market rate is based upon the, you know, the area that you live. Okay. Other things you can do, like on Indeed, you can put in a search in for an assistant in San Diego, California. And you'll see other people will post on those uh, Indeed ads, kind of what their pay range is. Uh, other things you can do, like I have access to as an HR professional, things called Conexa and ERI, which give us labor and wage statistics. So I can be able to access those types of things to kind of give you some additional data. The other, things you, the other things you can do, you know, obviously as entrepreneurs, we network, we talk to a lot of people, we can ask other entrepreneurs in the area, you know, what are you paying your assistant? You know, I'm thinking about hiring one. This is why I really need it in my business. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask the questions, you know, sure. especially to your peer, peer group. Sure. Well, that's, that's helpful. And, and in, I, again, it, it figure it's, I'm, I'm hearing something that you keep on saying that I just want to kind of extract is that you're figuring out what the end goal is, right? So you're figuring out what that role, what that responsibility, what that KPI is going to be. And then you kind of reverse engineer in order to then go do the marketing and go find that person. Uh, yeah. But you got to know what the destination is in order to create the roadmap in order to get there, right? Probably for, I mean, definitely for your business overall, but it, it breaks down even into like your hiring and firing and that kind of stuff. And uh, so I put the, put the job description together, put the roles and responsibilities together, put the KPIs together for this position for this box. And then I go and, and Marketing. ask friends, ask for referrals, go on Indeed, post on Facebook. All these applications start coming in. I get 30, 40, 50 applications for this, this job. How do you then screen through all that? Like, or you just you look for the congruencies. Does this person have the skill sets that I'm looking for in this job description? So you're able to easily go back and, and refer to that and say this person's in or this person is not in or could be in or, or, or definitely not in. And then, uh, and then what do you do? You do phone screens with everybody? Do you meet them in person? What does the interview process look like? Yeah, so it, it could be both. Normally, I start with a phone screen to try to figure out, again, fit. Because, you know, if they meet all the boxes from a you know, job responsibility, they have that experience, it's real easy. The next step is, you know, phone screening, you know, the top candidates and going through. And, you know, recruiting is a sales pitch, right? You're trying to sell an employee on why they should maybe leave their current, you know, employer or why they should come work for you and your business. So mm -hmm. it's talking to them about, you know, again, your company values and, and what great things the business is doing and what the team of people look like, you know, that you're going to be joining and then talking about, you know, the opportunity and, you know, people want opportunities to grow. They don't necessarily want to be stagnant. Now there are people that do, and that's okay. Cause we need people that are going to drive the bus, but not everybody wants to drive the bus. Right. Other people want to, you know, own the bus. Right. So it, it's understanding what their, you know, kind of long-term career goals are. So it's going through that phone screen, understanding, you know, this person a good fit. And if they're a good fit, you know, we whittle it down based upon that as well as kind of compensation. Because if someone wants to make $40 as an assistant and you're only budgeted to pay 15, they're probably not going to be a good match for you, right? Yeah. So we would why, go through. Why, why waste your time with an in-person, right? That's right. So we would go through and kind of, you know, weed out some of those people that just wouldn't be a good fit or that wouldn't be qualified based upon those things. You, you put the price or, or the, uh, the wage in the listing though, right? It, it depends on the job. I've done it both ways throughout my career. And it, so it really depends on the business and the owner and, okay. and manager of the person that's putting the job out there. So some people want that information advertised. Other people don't. It all depends on, you know, the business. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the other thing about the price, you know, another thing I forgot to mention, Tim, you know, you can go to salary.com, you can go to payscale.com and you get an idea on kind of what the market level is. Now, Sometimes those are inflated because people are putting that data in. <laughs> yep. So there's no like checks and balance. That's why the BLS is, is usually a good tool. Yeah. And, and when you do post, so I, I understand that sometimes you don't post it. Sometimes you do post it. When you do post uh, the wage, do you get, usually give a range or if it's a hard budget, like here's what, the most that I can pay in that way, it's just a setting clear expectation. Yeah. Again, I've done it both ways. Um, I think the range is probably the easiest way to do it because I think it gives you a little more flexibility as a business owner. And, you know, and I think, for example, we got a job that's going to pay 60 to 70 grand a year. If we, if I call somebody and they applied, you know, for the job and Tim, they want 72,000 a year, I'm not going to disqualify that candidate just because it's $2,000 above my budget, especially if they're the most qualified, they have the best fit from a company standpoint, I'm not going to lose sleep over $2,000. What about, 
hiring, are you hiring for that position or are you hiring, try and think of like, what's the next position that I can, that I can promote this person into? Uh, or are you looking at both of those things or not looking at it at all? Yeah, I look at both. So again, it depends on the position, but I always try to hire somebody one or two levels above where they come in at. So that helps me with further HR topics. We can talk about it at another time, but it talks about succession planning and kind yeah. of, you know, if I have an assistant, could they move into a, you know, project management type role? And then from there, can they get into maybe asset management and those types of things? So it's always about, you know, how can I build the best team possible? You know, and that's one of the things I'm really passionate about with HR and helping business owners is I get to build a team. So I get to be like a GM of the sports team. And I love my Cavs and I love my Indians and Browns, Cleveland guy. And yep. so making sure that we can build the best team possible and we ensure success. And that's what, you know, recruiting and staffing and hiring, you know, A players is all about. Yep. Uh, and, and one of the things in my business is, Hired an assistant, turn in my project manager. Hired another yeah. assistant, turn in my asset manager, as yeah. you're saying these things. Probably that's why you said it. Turn, hired another assistant, turn yeah. in my COO. You know, like, like I love it because because they're around you. They understand how you think. They understand how you make decisions. They understand how the business responds. Yeah. And, and you see them kind of like elevate into certain roles or certain um, skill sets, I guess, that, that, that they're really, really good at. Um, Speaking of that, do you guys do, or do you suggest doing a, a disc analysis or a Myers-Briggs type indicator, so like some sort of either personality or behavioral assessment that will indicate what somebody may be strong or weak in and, and testing out that before you have them come out and do an interview? Yeah, so I, I've done it a number of ways, Tim, but um, with DISC, so after I would do the phone screen, a lot of times before I would hire a candidate and bring them in for a formal interview, Typically, I'd have them do a disc or even after that formal interview and see if they should go to the next round or if we should even hire that candidate. Um, I like DISC. I like Myers-Briggs. They're good tools, but they shouldn't be the end-all, be-all for you know hiring decision. I think, in my opinion, those personality tests, a lot of times in the 15 years I've been in HR, like I've taken DISC three times personally, and I've gotten three different results. Really? I'm either a straight D, I'm a DI, or I'm an ID. And it all depends on kind of, you know, if I worked 15 hours at my job and I came home that night. Yeah, it depends on I, when you took the test, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. So I may answer it one way versus if, you know, I'm drinking a beer and I'm taking the disc assessment, I'm probably going to be more of an eye, yeah. you know? So it, it all depends. I think they're good tools, but they shouldn't be the end all be all. And, you know, when you look at disc, you know, when you build your team, you don't want to have a team full of all Ds. You know, you want kind of that balanced yeah. wheel. So everybody has a place, everybody has a spot. And that goes back to the, the org chart, the roles, responsibilities, and that gets into your buy-in on your team. Yeah. Love that, man. Um, that, you know, just as you're talking, I'm reflecting on my own team and um, who falls in which, which box on the Bucket. disc assess. Yep. Yeah. And um, it, it's been fairly accurate, but there's definitely, it doesn't mean that if somebody is a high D or a high C that they can't get into the I box a little bit. It's yep. just, it means that it's not a driving force for them. It's, it, it drains them. It takes them a little bit more work to yep. work in that box than in their, in their, um, you know, Goldilocks zone of being a C and looking at the analytics and the data and, and that kind of stuff. And same thing for like me, I'm high D, high I, and I can go and do the spreadsheets. I can go and put standard operating procedures and checklists and that kind of stuff together. It's just, it takes more work for me to do that. It takes more energy for me to do that than it does for me to go and do marketing or to, you know, do public speaking or something along those lines. That comes very natural to me and it actually energizes me. And I got, I get a lot of, uh, um, good vibes because of it, uh, because that's my natural zone. So just right. because somebody falls in one of these different four boxes doesn't mean that they can't perform in the other boxes. Um, and that's one of the things that was helpful to me when I was hiring for this one. Uh, I'm thinking, well, I, I, I kind of need them to do a little bit of this too. Like my sales guy, he's got to be able to work through a CRM system, right? Yeah. And he's not a data or analytic type, but they got to be able to do that. So uh, can they do that? And, and, you know, you're trying to just balance all that kind of stuff out. So, um, good stuff, man. So now you're telling me that, uh, all right, we've, we've posted the lead on indeed. We've asked for referrals. We have 50, uh, applications that come in. We phone screened everybody. Maybe we've even given them a disc assessment to make sure that, uh, they, they fit in a certain, um, criteria or mindset or, or, or energy level. Right. And so now you're going to do in-person interviews, right? Correct. And how many of those, let's say 50 people applied, how many in-person interviews would you typically do? So like for your roles, Five, or 10, 
No, it, it, normally at the most three to four. I, I don't like four. to give more. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, when I work with a business, it's important not to overwhelm them. I mean, that's why you would hire me or partner with me. So I want to give you the top three or four candidates. So yeah. that's my job to kind of screen them, go through that process. And even when I was working for the private equity firm, same thing. I'm not going to give the hiring manager 10 people to interview. To me, that's just a waste of their time. It's, it's a big waste of time, right? And as you're, I really didn't know the answer before I asked you that. But I, as I'm thinking of it, like, if you asked me to sit down and interview 10 people, I'd be like, dude, there's no chance <laughs> in hell that no. I'll ever do that. That's why I'm hiring you. Yep. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it's, I guess it was, pretty, it was good. Um, and, then, and then I remember, you know, when you came in, you helped me hire our executive assistant. And you brought four people and it was like really difficult to narrow it. I mean, one person was, was a clear not fit once we had a in-person interview with them. And then the other three were very difficult to kind of narrow down. They were all, they all had the skill set. They all had the, the, you know, technical knowledge on what to do and how to do it. But it ended up being really a fit of culture, right? Absolutely. That we ended up hiring. So tell me a little bit about what you're looking for in the in-person interviews and the types of questions you asked a lot of like very revealing questions that I think were pretty eye-opening to me as the employer of, of understanding what the employee was looking like was looking yeah. for I'm sorry yeah and especially in your case Tim when we hired your assistant you know uh, you know it was great because we just got done with the company values and so when we were going through those the top three out of the four that we brought in I was able to say okay you know Tim does this person match this can you see them working here you know, do you see the values that we talked about? And, and we brought up the values with each of the candidates and said, okay, how do you live those things out? So I think that made it an easier process. And then, you know, after the, you know, the interviews were over, you and I sat down with your COO and we said, okay, you know, what's your thoughts on this person? Can you see them working here? And then it came down to the fit and the culture. I asked a lot of, you know, during the interview, the, the front screen questions are more about the technical aspect of the job. When I bring them on site and we do a formal interview, it's more behavioral based questions. So I'll ask them, you know, give me a time where you were disappointed with something that you did at work where you made a mistake. You know, how did you learn from that? That gives me a good idea if somebody, number one, admits that they're not perfect because no one's perfect. Number two, it gives me a good opportunity to understand that, you know, when they make a, made a mistake, they're able to fix it on their own. So they were resourceful, right? They didn't need to go ask for a bunch of help. And then number three, that they were able to, you know, make sure that they put a system or a process or something in place. So they didn't continue to make that mistake. So yeah. I like to ask that type of question. Another good question I like. To I, ask. That's a really good one because it makes them a, like, it shows an awareness. It shows a resourcefulness. It shows, you know, a plan of action. It's a, that's, that's a really good question. So what, what about the other one about um, like balancing lifestyle or yeah. work-life balance? Like, well, that was a really good one too. Yeah. So you know, I'll ask questions. Another couple of good ones. So like when I'm hiring an assistant, you know, for example, or an office person, I want to know. Do you consider yourself more of a strategic planner, somebody that dreamcasts and visions, or are you more of an executioner, somebody that does? And, and they, they don't get to an option to pick both. It's either one or the other. And so, you know, when someone says they're an executioner for the assistant level, I think that's a better fit because I'm looking yeah. for someone to come into my business and really get stuff done. You yeah. know, I, I don't want to hire an assistant necessarily that wants to dreamcast and vision cast. Can they do that as part of their job? Sure, especially if they're going to move up within the organization you know, one or two levels above where we bring them in. But it's important to understand kind of where they're at today. And then another good question I like to ask is, you know, what's most important to you? You know, the, the being happy at what you do, making a ton of money or your work-life balance. And that gives me another good idea of kind of what type of person they are. And then once I ask that, again, they got to pick one of those three and then I ask them to expand on why. Um, another question I like to ask. Let's, kinda, let's, let's oh, go back to that one. That was very, very revealing to me because – as, as a high D in the business world, you know, um, and I'm pretty high I in like, like, just like you were saying, you know, in business, I'm high D in um, social settings, I'm high I. And so as a high D in the business world, I think everybody's motivated by money, right? I think right. everybody's motivated by wanting to light the world on fire, breaking records. And um, if you guys aren't familiar with DISC, that's what we're talking about, D-I-S-C. So yeah. uh, go and like just Google search DISC assessment, take a, take a DISC assessment on yourself, have your wife take a DISC assessment, have everybody on your team take a DISC assessment, and then read about what that, what that means. And it'll be very revealing. And when you're talking to people, you're like, oh, this person you know, is high, high C, I need to talk a little bit more analytics to them or this person's, um, you know, high S is probably what we were looking for, for an assistant, more of a supportive role, a helper role. Yeah. Um, high I is more interpersonal and, um, 
uh, more your sales types of, of creating relationships. And then high D is, is more of a driver, um, can be direct. very, yeah, direct, can be very uh, almost offensive sometimes, right? Because yeah. they just care about results, right? Yeah. And so as a very results-driven person in business, uh, we think everybody else is, you know, money motivated, but the reality is, you know, the, is. The, the eyes like to have fun. They don't, yeah. they don't like, even though they're, they're sales, they like to have a good time and the, having a good time and having the social atmosphere weighs more heavily than making a few more bucks. Uh, big time with the S's, the S's, uh, they care about compensation, but it's, it's low on the totem pole. Um, they care about supporting everybody else. They por- care about helping other people. They care about work-life balance, things like that. Um, and then the C's, you know, the C's can be maybe a little bit of both, but they really want to understand things. They want to learn, they want to develop. Um, and then the D's are the ones who really want to break records and make a diff- or like make a, make a, a ton of money and, um, build and drive, something big and drive the organization. Yeah. 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 And, well, things like that. Well, and I think too, I mean, again, a good person, you know, a good employee can adapt based upon the settings that you put them in. And again, having your team take it, you know, again, there's value in that because it helps you as a manager or a leader to understand how to communicate with them. So there's definitely value. I don't want to say that they're awful, but again, I think that sometimes they can be skewed based upon when you take those tests. That's all I was saying yeah. back earlier. And, and it's, and it's very revealing when you're sitting down asking somebody more of a behavioral type question or a hypothetical type question of what's more important to you. Is it work-life balance? Is it making an impact or is it money? And everybody, almost at, like everybody in that, in the, when we were interviewing executive assistants, they all said work-life balance, you know? Yep. Um, and so, so that was revealing where as long as we can give them that environment, that's going to keep people around. Giving them a $5,000 raise or a $2,000 raise or $20,000 raise isn't necessarily going to keep them around if the other stuff isn't there. And I think that's where some of the company culture and core values comes in. So right. um, let's, let's, parlay into that. Let's talk a little bit more about company culture and, and what that looks like. How do you convey that in a, in a one hour interview with an employee um, and making sure that somebody fits the company culture? How do you, how do you make sure that they like the company culture and at the same time, they're going to be a fit for the company culture and not, not derail anything? So I, I think it's important to talk about the business and, and explain again what the company values are, what you're doing to live those company values out. I know Tim, when we talk, you know, you've donated a lot of money to different charity organizations. And I think people feel good when they're, you know, part of something bigger. So, you know, talking about those things, asking them maybe, you know, what type of volunteer work they like to do, getting a sense for, you know, how they you know, spend their time outside of work. You know, you got to be careful how you ask that question, but getting an understanding for, you know, the, the, what they like to do and how they like to help people. Um, I think that's important from a cultural standpoint. But then also, you know, when you when it comes to team building activities and, you know, like your place of employment, you're a fun, you know, dr- uh, results driven organization. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, what type of activities do you guys do? I know you do like a monthly kind of team building activity. And so it's talking about that and, and seeing what their response is, especially when you're in person, you know, it's much easier to look at nonverbal communication. You know, if you know, their arms are folded or if they're looking off into space and they're not looking you in the eye, they're really not engaged. So those are things that I look at, you know, the nonverbal stuff, as well as asking those behavioral questions, mm-hmm. but, you know, culture, you know, that's another question I ask, you know, is what's most important to you, you know, the job title you hold, the industry that you work in, or is it the culture? And I would say probably, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when I first started in HR, it was all about the job title and the position that someone held. And now it's really, you know, changed. It's all about culture. And it's mm-hmm. all about, you know, the environment that somebody works in, you know, is it a friendly environment? Is it a welcoming environment? Is there teamwork that, you know, happens? And those are things that obviously you can't always tell during the interview process, but you can talk about it. You can see what their reaction is. You can ask them, you know, for, give me an example of a time you've had to work, you know, in a team environment. What was your experience like? Give me a specific example. And you could do the same thing, you know, like even really high functioning teams, there's conflict from time to time. Asking them, you know, how how do you deal with conflict? But give me an example in your work, you know, career where you've encountered conflict and how did you go about, uh, you know, making that into a positive outcome with that conflict? Love it, man. No, that's good stuff. Um, uh, uh, that's great. I, tell me, tell me, like, you alluded to a couple of these things of like, well, you can't really, you know, you, you need to be able to ask it, but ask it in a way that, you know, can't get you in trouble, right? 
tell me some of the big no-nos or maybe like give me a couple bullet points on some things you got to watch out for when you're hiring somebody and the questions you can or cannot ask um, or the things you can do or, or, or not do. Like what are, the, what are the best practices for hiring an employee? So when you're, when you're interviewing somebody, uh, they can ask questions are going to be the ones that are really about the job and their work experience. So focus on the work experience, ask behavioral type uh, based questions. You can contact me. You can ask me what those are. You can also Google some of those for some more examples, but they cannot, you know, you never ask about their age. You never ask about their gender. You can't talk about their marital status. You can't talk about disabilities. You can't talk about you know, religion, or you don't want to stay away from politics. Don't get into any of those things that can get you in trouble or you may have a potential lawsuit. So you want to stay away from those types of things that really are outside of the workplace. So, I mean, what if you, uh, what if you run a Hooters, right? And you need to, you need to hire a Hooters, like a waitress. Are you allowed to, I mean, I don't know if some 400 pound guy comes in and says he wants to be a Hooters waitress. It, do I have to hire them? And I don't own a Hooters. I'm just saying like, like, isn't there, isn't there some sort of like, Hey, this is the job description. You don't fit that job description. And, and what if it is gender based? So with that, obviously that's where you need those defined roles and responsibilities. And with the job description, you have kind of the physical requirements of the job on there. And so with that, you know, if it's a gender specific role, it's a little bit different. And if, for example, if a female came in and it's supposed to be a male role or a male role and it should be a female, I probably won't even interview them, right? So I won't even get to that point where I put myself in that type of situation. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess there's just there's certain situations where it needs to be a certain age range or, or physical uh, physical demands on the job, right? You're not going to hire some lady who's who's 85 years old to come and do construction or roofing or something like right. that, right? Just because, uh, and can that be construed as? Um, as a bias or as discrimination uh, based on either gender or age because of that. I don't, I don't, I don't know. So, uh, so when you have those physical demands of the job, so if we have a construction job, for example, and the requirement is to lift, you know, 75 pounds on a consistent basis, you know, when you're in the interview process and, you know, Sally applies and she's an 85 year old woman, you can say, Sally, here's the job description. Make sure you read it over. Do you have any questions? Do you feel do you have any concerns about the job? You know, and then you can go through some of those things and ask, you know, those types of questions in order yeah. to kind of go through the process of elimination without going anything that's illegal or maybe kind of on the questionable yeah. side. It goes back to setting good expectations, right? Having a Absolutely. really good job description written out and setting clear expectations with everybody and then screening those applicants properly, I guess. Um, no, that's good. Good stuff. So tell me a little bit about. So we talked a lot about hiring, right? And bringing in and filling the right seats. Now, what happens right. if you got somebody in the seat and they're not a good fit for that seat <laughs> or you hire somebody who's not a good fit for the culture, for the organization? What's the best practices for firing people? So that's something you never want to do, right? But as business owners, we do it all the time. And you got to, all, man. Yeah. yeah. Because if, again, you, you don't want somebody that's a, a toxic person on your team because yeah. that's going to kill your morale and the rest of your team. So to me, it's about, it's a, you know, I like to make sure I have documentation. That's why I've won so many state unemployment claims against employees that have contested or filed uh, for those claims. So it's about documentation, having conversations. Again, once those clear expectations are given with the job descriptions or the KPIs or the goals, and they're not meeting those, you know, talking to that employee, I like to do coaching at first, you know, document that we had, you know, we had a coaching session with Johnny. Johnny, you're not hitting this target. You know, how can I help you? That, right that, that's good because that shows that you were making an effort to absolutely to advance that person or or fix the problem as the owner or as the uh, as the higher up in the company. That's right, and it's important. You know, it should be an interactive process where you're talking to people and giving them the opportunity to learn. Because you know, hiring people is you know it can be expensive, but also firing people can be even more expensive. I mean, the cost of turnover or on a position that's been established for a couple of years could be anywhere from one and a half to two times someone's salary. Mm. So it's important that, you know, you take the time, you try to so, develop. So if people. you hold up, let's say that again, if you hire the wrong person, it can cost them, it'll cost you as the business owner, likely two times whatever their annual salary is. So if, I, if I hire the wrong $50,000 employee, it's going to cost me probably a hundred thousand dollars to fire that person hire somebody new, retrain that person, go through the loss of revenue. That, that's harder to quantify. But if you, if you try to bring all that stuff in there, um, that's, a, that's a big statistic, man. That's a big number. 
Yeah, and, and that's where obviously making sure you do it the right way and trying to work with the employee first before you go. You, know, you don't want to be a trigger happy person that fires Johnny just because Johnny did something wrong. You know, it's about, again, coaching, sitting down. You know, Johnny made a mistake here. I want to work with you. And when you do those types of coaching sessions, Tim, you can't do them in public in front of the rest of your team. You know, they got to be kind of one on one. Uh, if you know it's going to be a difficult conversation, it's, it's important to have like a witness. Yeah. Um, so that way it doesn't get out of control. But, you know, yeah, making the wrong hire can really cost the business. And, you know, it's some of that stuff's, you know, hard to quantify, but typically one and a half to two times is a good metric or, you know, value when you make a wrong hire. So especially someone that's been with the company for, let's say, three or four years yeah. because of that lost productivity and the retraining. And then if you've got hiring expenses or, you know, let's say worst case scenario, that employee brings a suit against your company. I mean, it can cost you even more if you have something like that that goes yeah. on. So, but, but it goes back to documentation, uh, you know, having those conversations, keeping things to facts and data. You know, you don't want to fire, you know, Sally because Sally was mean to you. I mean, that's not a, a good reason. <laughs> you know, you right. have to, you know, S Sally stole something, right? And you have facts and data that prove that Sally, you know, took the company credit card and bought, you know, I don't know, a golf club set for her husband, okay? Yeah. And you know that that's not a normal business expense. Obviously, that's more, that's an easier situation to have a conversation. You bring Sally in, have a witness. Sally, did you do this? Yes, I did. Bye bye, Sally. Right. And so, so, it, makes so it, I, it, it doesn't need to be like a three strike rule in order to fire Sally in, in an instance like that. But if it's right. a non performing type thing, you want to be able to show a track record and at least two, what, two, three, four conversations of trying to advance them and get yep. them performing better. And then, uh, um, and then you could have that conversation. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. And it depends on the situation. I mean, best practice typically is you have, you know, progressive discipline set up in your company where someone doesn't do something. Maybe it's a coaching the first two times, the third time they make a mistake, it's a written warning or a verbal warning. Yeah. And then from there, maybe you do a suspension and a final uh, notice that, you know, you know, Johnny, you do the same thing again, or you make any other mistakes, you know, in the next year, we're going to let you go, you know, and that way, again, it takes the emotion out of it, especially if it's facts and data. And when something happens that you have to address with an employee, don't wait a month to talk to that employee. Do it like right away. Mm -hmm. Make sure you, you as the, the manager, you take some of that emotion out of it. So again, you kind of compose yourself because you don't want to yell. Like yelling doesn't do anything to me. I mean, as an mm -hmm. HR professional, keep it professional, talk to them, have the conversation, have a witness if you feel it's going to get escalated and make sure you document date, time, what happened, give like a summary and that will help you out. I read a quote this morning, um, just, you know, a general 88 things I learned in life or something like that. And one of the quotes or one of the line items was yelling never, ever helps a situation no matter what. That's doesn't right. matter. That's in right. any situation, yelling does not help. So why, why do it? Just stay calm, stay collected. Uh, people, you'll be perceived as, as more um, uh, level-headed, right? Just by not yelling and not getting all upset. And um, no, it's, that's important stuff. But I, I also like that you said, hey, you got to try to coach these people. Like you yeah. as the business owner, it is your responsibility to put all this stuff or, or make sure that they have what they need in order to be successful. That's and right. a lot of times, especially small business owners who are busy and they're, they're you know, not only building and growing the business, but they're also working in the business and doing things uh, from an operational standpoint, those, those owners aren't spending the time to educate their team and to train their team the right way. So you got to take 100% responsibility over this yeah. stuff and realize that if your employee fails, that's probably, on you. Pro probably first level, it's on you as the business owner, as the you leader of your organization, because you didn't set them up for success. That's right. Um, now it, it gets to a point where you know you can only do so much for somebody, and and you'll know when you meet that point or when when you're at that point, um, and then you have to make some tough decisions. But typically, you know, by doing the metrics and following the KPIs and measuring their results on a weekly basis or daily basis, and um, and then having those sit down meetings with them you're going to have a very good inclination of are they doing it or not? And they're going to have an idea of, of are they going to stay there or not? Because they're right. going to know if they're succeeding or if they're not succeeding. So that's good stuff, man. Um, cool. Well, I know I, here's, here's the thing I've learned about HR. This stuff goes deep, right? And there's so many different levels to it and there's a lot of different moving parts in it. And, um, and what I realized is when I first started trying to hire an assistant, an executive assistant on my own, 
it just took me out of my zone. It's not what I'm good at. It's not my unique ability is going out and hiring employees, right? I need to be going and focused on the marketing side, on yep. driving the business, on the visionary type activities as the owner. Because, because one, I'm losing revenue if I'm not doing those things. I'm losing uh, um, traction if I'm not doing those things. And two, I got to go through a learning curve over here trying to learn how to be an HR expert and I'm getting kicked in the teeth over and over again. I'm going to screw it up. It's going to cost me more time and more money than just hiring somebody like you to yep. come in and do it. And yep. so it's been, um, no, man, I mean, I mean, I mean, for, for uh, one, I want to thank you for coming in and helping out my business. And I want to make sure that other entrepreneurs and business owners understand that people like you exist. And um, I, I can attest for Scott, for anybody who's listening to the show that's looking to level up their business, to put core values in place, to help clean up their organizational chart, roles, responsibilities, KPIs, anything like that, uh, hiring, firing, like you do all those things for businesses. So I know that you, I want to, I want to make sure business owners know that they're not alone in this endeavor. I thought I was very alone before I realized that somebody like you could be hired to come in and help me just organize all that stuff and fast track it. Like you came in into my team for a day or two and met with everybody, helped organize everything. And it just like brought so much uh, um, insight to me and how I was running my organization. And we, we put those good foundational elements together and it wasn't, it wasn't expensive, right? It was, it was um, uh, for, especially when you put it in a framework of what it will do for your business and how much, how many more millions of dollars you can generate in revenue. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, you know, uh, a few thousand bucks. So it was, it was unbelievable. And I don't want to quote your prices or anything like that. So <laughs> if anybody has interest in having Scott come in and just kind of put those foundational elements together, hit him up. Um, I'm, I'm going to give, I'm going to ask you to give everybody your contact information in a second here, but I know you also do the hiring, um, and stuff. And I know you can also just be on retainer, for, yep. for a company and for a, for a pretty nominal monthly fee, they can just be able to reach out to you. Help, you'll be able to support them. And I don't, I don't want to get into all that kind of stuff, but I just want them to know that that's, that's an opportunity. And whether you guys decide to use Scott or another company, these human resources uh, uh, support networks, you don't have to bring on and pay somebody like Scott multiple six figures to come in and work in your organization. That's right. I mean, it can be a fractional, however much you need them or not need them, like make sure you're utilizing those people so that way you can focus on what you're really good at as the owner of your business and then bring in the experts to do what they're really good at because it's going to save you time. It's going to save you money. It's going to be done the right way and you're not going to lose out on revenue because you're not doing those revenue generating activities as a C as the CEO of your business. So, um, Good stuff, man. Why don't you tell everybody how they can get a hold of you and contact you and, and um, uh, potentially work with you? Thanks, Tim. So Scott Hannes is my name. You can go ahead and follow me and like me on Facebook at Fortitude HR Solutions. You can also contact me via email at scott at fortitudehrsolutions.com. I love it, man. And we'll put all your contact information in the show notes. The, the thing to understand here, though, is everybody wants to grow their business, right? Yep. We all want to grow. We all want to grow it really, really fast. The difference is you don't want to grow it fast because if you don't have the right foundational elements to your business, it will crumble and yep. it will be a massive headache and undertaking to try to turn the ship around at that point. You want to build your business right before you start building it fast. Um, so um, I want that to be a key takeaway. Grow it the right way, not just grow it, right? And make sure you have the basis and, and the, the foundation for a successful business. So, uh, Scott, ton of value, ton of insight. Thank you so much for being here, brother. And, um, uh, I gotta have you on the show again, because I know we can go way, way deeper into a lot of this stuff. So, uh, thank you, bud. And, uh, thank guys, it's been another episode of the legacy wealth show. I hope you guys got a ton of value out of it and uh, connect with Scott. If you have any needs from the human resources side, thanks guys. <laughs>